Good morning, church. The scripture this morning comes from Matthew 27, verse 27 to 50. Then the governor's soldiers took Jesus into the praetorium and gathered the whole company of soldiers around him. They stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him and then twisted together a crown of thorns and set it on his head. They put a staff in his right hand. Then they knelt in front of him and mocked him. Hail, King of the Jews, they said. They spit on him and took the staff and struck him on the head again and again. After they had mocked him, they took off the robe and put his clothes on him. Then they led him away to crucify him. As they were going out, they met a man from Cyrene named Simon, and they forced him to carry the cross. They came to a place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. There, they offered Jesus wine to drink mixed with gall, but after tasting it, he refused to drink it. When they had crucified him, they divided up his clothes by casting lots. And sitting down, they kept watch over him there. Above his head, they placed the written charge against him. This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Two rebels were crucified with him, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, you who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. Come down from the cross if you are the son of God. In the same way, the chief priests and teachers of the law and the elders mocked him. He saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. He's the king of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God rescue him now if he wants him. For he said, I am the son of God. In the same way, the rebels who crucified him, crucified, who were crucified with him, also heaped insults on him. From noon until three in the afternoon, darkness came over all the land. About three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lemma sach, lemma, lemma sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing there heard this, they said, he's calling Elijah. Immediately, one of them ran and got a sponge. He filled it with wine vinegar, put it on a staff and offered it to Jesus to drink. The rest said, now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to save him. And when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. This is the word of the Lord. Seriously speaking, we shouldn't even be here today. I mean, think about it. I mean, it actually should have all died that day. I mean, there were only a handful of people left around the cross. I mean, I spoke a bit about it last week. Uh, on Palm Sunday, when I spoke about the thousands and thousands of people that were all there that day for Palm Sunday coming into uh, Jerusalem, <clears throat> never mind the thousands of people that, that Jesus ministered to during his life, whether it was feeding the 10 or 15,000 people or, you know, the, healing the blind and doing all the rest of it. Um, <clears throat> there were actually only a few left uh, huddled around the cross. Uh, most of the disciples had run away. Uh, and if, in fact, if we're honest about it, it was only woman who remained around the cross right at the end to take his body down. I mean, I, this thing should have just died there, in all honesty. And, and then even, even after his death uh, and, and, and resurrection, as I said last week, you know, the Bible tells us in, in the book of Acts that there were only like 140 people that were gathered around afterwards. Um, so most of them had run away on the day of the crucifixion or leading up to the crucifixion, and then, then sort of this ragamuffin bunch of people got together, and they counted, there were just under 140 of them left. I mean, think about it. Against the Roman Empire, against the might of, the, of Judaism and Israel, this thing should have died. I've, I've been to Golgotha and, um, on one of our trips, and uh, it's, man, it's a terrible sight, seriously. Even today, I mean, some people complain uh, because like right underneath Golgotha where it is today, there's, it's like a mess. It's like a, it's like a bus 
rank type, like a type of a bus and taxi rank. Um, uh, I mean, it's a huge mess. It's like an industrial area. It's shocking. Just below Golgotha. Uh, well, it's so it was on, this, on the day itself. Remember, it was on a dumping ground. I mean, they're not going to go and uh, manicure the lawns and you know, plant daisies and that where they're crucifying people. So he was crucified on a rubbish dump outside of the city. Uh, it should have just ended there. But here we are today. Millions and millions of followers. Because the essence of, of the crucifixion of Christ and Easter is bigger than us. It's much bigger than us. And so the work that Jesus did leading up to his death, the healing people and loving people and showing grace and being kind and generous and ministering to people and doing all that he did, well, it didn't end there because it was picked up again. And almost when you thought that that, that little flame was going to be blown out, so it's like, you know, just before it seemed like it was about to die, something happened. And here we are today. You know, because after his resurrection, he commissioned us. It was, he says in the end of Matthew, he goes, man, I've done the work before that led me to the cross. But now I'm no longer here and I'm commissioning you to do it now. So you've got to go now, he said to his followers. You must go and preach the gospel. You must look for those who are lost. You must minister to the wounded. You must care for the sick and the dying. You must go to those who have lost hope. You must be in constant prayer and you must love unconditionally. And so it was picked up by his followers. And you and I are, are a result of that. And we can't allow this momentum to stop or to even slow down. We have to continue to, to do what he has called us to do because he died on the cross. His public ministry came to an end that he could do and it could only extend so far. But really what he did by dying on the cross was hand over the baton to us as his followers to now continue his earthly ministry as he was nailed to the cross. It is no surprise that the church grows the fastest when it is being crucified. There is no, because the church growth doesn't just naturally happen uh, when everything is going so well because the church ends up, and you and I end up becoming complacent. But our growth as people and the growth of the church is sped up when we are being crucified. Our characters are shaped. Who we are as people is shaped. In fact, the, the Bible, in fact, says that we are really shaped when we're in the fire. It's not often that we grow as people when we're up on the, having mountaintop experiences. But the time that really shapes us and grows us and develops us as people and as Christians happens when we are being crucified or when we're suffering, or when we're in the fire. So on that day, the day that we remember today, a day that is called Good Friday. Why on earth would it be called Good Friday? Well, it's called Good Friday because we know where it ends. We know it doesn't end here. It's called Good Friday because Jesus' ministry is put into the hands of others to continue. It's called Good Friday it would, be, it would be called Bad Friday if it ended there. But it's not. It's a Good Friday. And so Jesus' earthly ministry, in a sense, partly came to an end as each nail was driven into the cross. And from the cross and from the nails, he calls us to continue his work. So I'm going to speak about those, those four nails this morning. I want to just say to you at the end of the service, uh, of, my, well, of my speaking, I'm going to give you a time, uh, myself a time to, to really recommit ourselves to this work, to make a commitment of saying this is not going to end with us in our generation, but in fact we're going we're gonna to ramp up the work of God and the work of Christ. It's a good time for us at the foot of the cross, 
for us to figure out where we are in our faith. It's a good time for us to, to reconcile with God. It's even a good time for those who have never crossed the line of faith to cross the line today. So at the end of my, my sermon, I'm going to give a minute for us to respond in a prayer of either a first-time commitment or us a recommitment to continue the work that Christ died for. So I want to look at the, firstly at the, at the first two nails. The two nails that were used and first nailed his hands to the cross. They nailed his hands that he had used in ministry. They nailed his hands, the ones that healed lepers, the ones that healed the blind, the ones that healed the lame. The same hands that would have been used to break bread, to feed loaves and fish, they were now nailed to a criminal's cross. In his book, Grace for the Moment, Max Lucado writes this. He says, when human hands fastened divine hands to the cross with spikes, it wasn't the soldiers who, hand, who held the hands of Jesus. It was God who held them steady. Those same hands that, that formed the oceans and built the mountains, those same hands that designed the dawn and crafted each cloud, those same hands that blueprinted one incredible plan for you and for me, those are the hands that held the hands of Christ to the cross. And so because his hands are nailed to the cross, he needs our hands. He needs our hands to go and touch the sick, the hurting, the dying. And we need to be the hands that go and, and restore people's hope. Our hands now are called to be, to be hands and work of ministry. See, for far too long, far too long, many people thought that following Jesus Christ meant that you dress up on a Sunday, you come and sit through a time of worship, and, and then you go home again. But you and I know it's not that. He calls us to to so much more. Doesn't he? He calls us, and we've seen it here in the life of this church, and I've seen you do it. Roll up your sleeves. Get your hands dirty in the work of ministry. We, we are called to leave the stained glass of the church in order to reach stained lives outside of the life of the church. We are called to get out of our comfort zones and, and go and lovingly share the message of hope. He's depending on you and me. Can, can I tell you the bottom line? A lot of people who don't know God don't care about this church or what we do here on a Sunday. It's like they couldn't care less. I've said this to you before on a Sunday morning. You know, you might wake up all excited about church and could never think of missing church because it's part of what we do. We honor God and we meet together and we, you know, that's what we do. I mean, it's, it's a big part of our lives, church, isn't it? You know? But you can go past the Mall of Africa or Santon, whatever, Santon City, whatever. There are millions of people who wake up every Sunday morning and don't even give church a second thought. Don't even think about God any time of the day. They don't care about our church's history. They don't care about how brilliant our worship team is. They don't worry about whether we serve great coffee after church or whether the, the well, they'll never moan about the preacher preaching too long anyway. Um, or, you know... They're not interested in that. I think that what people outside of the church want to see, they're waiting to see if our walk matches our talk. You know, they want, they want, to, they want to see when, you know, when, when we sing words of God's love, mercy, and grace, uh, if that actually leaves the church and, and, and is carried out into the streets. You know, uh, they want to see if those who, who pray for God's justice and justice in the world practice justice. I think that's when people sit up and, and notice Jesus Christ. You know, I went, into, I went to a church the once, and um, <laughs> when, we, when we were about to have communion, and it was just, just something that they do. It's not a big deal, but uh, it was a bit different, a uh, bit weird for me, to be honest. And at the, at the end of your, as you came out of your chairs, there was someone who sprayed your hands with disinfectant. So I'm like... And so they sprayed it, and you like, and I said to the pastor, I was like, what is up with that? They go, no, like there's germs and stuff like that going around and that, you know. And before we have communion, we've got to like disinfect our hands and that, you know. 
And, and I'll never forget thinking that as I went forward for communion. I actually, I actually felt a bit ashamed. Because like in my mind, I actually had this, this picture in my, something similar to this in my mind. Like, so yeah, I arrived for communion with these like lily white, you know, cream hands and, you know, I've got disinfectant, so it's all like above board and all the rest of it. But the hands that reach out to me are in fact bloodied and bruised and dirty. You know? And we don't live, we, we are not meant to have this, this disinfected faith that goes around that is so, you know. But my understanding is that it's, it's a bit like that. So I'm wondering for a moment if you can humor me. Can you, can you take a moment to look at your hands? So just hold your hands out in front of you and have a look at them. Okay, so I'm going to give you about 20 seconds to go through the, man, I need a manicure or my... My hands are looking very dry, stuff like that, you know. And wives, you can quickly moan at your husband quickly because he hasn't cleaned his nails for a while or something like that. So you've got a couple of seconds to do that. But I'm just wondering, as you look at them, and you just keep on looking while I'm talking, if you don't mind, like, so when was the last time your hands did the work of Christ? Are your hands so clean and disinfected because and well manicured from a faith perspective? I want you to carry on looking at them if you don't mind. And you might be going, oh, well, I've helped my family. Well, that doesn't count. You might go, well, you're supposed to do that anyway. You might go, well, I used my hands to draw money from the ATM to tithe or to give to the well. You're supposed to do that anyway. But like, when was the last time your hands were used to, to minister to anyone? The needy, the hurting. See, Jesus' hands, as you can see on the screens, are nailed to the cross. As a reminder, But now it's up to you and me. Now it's up to you and me. And one of the things I'm the most great, and I'm a bit biased when it comes to this church. One of the things that I'm really grateful for in this church is there are so many people who's got their hands dirty. So many of you minister to our children. There are some people here today who are in the earlier service because they do children's church first and then they come here. Oh, they were in the welcome team, uh, and now they're here. And this week, they're going to be doing stuff. And a lot of you, your hands are dirty. But can I maybe suggest that for, for too many of us, our hands are way too clean. And Christ is depending on us to, to continue his work. So those were the first two nails. The third nail was for his feet. So one nail dro- was driven through Jesus' feet. Can you imagine the, the pain just for a moment as they went through flesh and muscle and bone? You see, they try to make sure he doesn't go anywhere from there. They thought that that's it. Once they'd nailed him to the cross, he couldn't move anywhere. And you see this thing, this radical Christ, this radical Messiah, this radical Jew would be kept to Jerusalem. And so his teachings would be kept there. And hopefully it would be kept on the rubbish dump, quite frankly. Messed and bruised and bloodied. Spat on and slapped. That's where it would stay. (laughs) Little did they know. But part of it is because he called those who follow him to go to places where he would have gone. To meet people that he would have met. He's going, they might have nailed me here to this cross, but you will never stop my followers, ever. And so he taught us to follow in his footsteps. 
Uh, and in Matthew, he reminds us that we must follow him. He expects us to travel. He expects us to move. In fact, in Matthew 28, he said, he said we should go to the ends of the earth. And I, don't, I know that he meant that physically, that we should go to the ends of the earth. But I think that we should also go to the ends of the earth for others. Just like he went to the ends of the earth. Uh, in, in his steps, um, in 1 Peter, it says we must be willing to endure suffering for his sake. Um, and, and Paul said to, to the Romans, he said, those who bring good news have beautiful feet. Uh, so I'm wondering, where, where, have, where have our feet taken us to the kingdom of God? I, I'm so, man, when I hear about these, when I hear about the 10th um, uh, opening uh, or closing they're going to be having in Leokop right across the road, yeah, you know I've got nightmares about that. You know, like one day we, you know, we come face to face with God and God's going, hey, man, carry me, man. Listen, yeah, man, Leokop was across the road. Uh, you had clay oven just down the road, like two kilometers away. Seriously, what impacted, like, you know, was it even pointless that we existed here? You know, we got issues around here. And I'm, when I hear about people going into prison now to go and minister to the prisoners in Matthew 25, that says, when Jesus said, I was in prison and you never visited me. But we are in Leukop. We, we're in the Clay Oven community. This church rocks. And I'm not even kidding you. I mean, we're sending a whole group of people out to the Northern Free State. I think it's like next weekend, uh, Northern Cape, that are going to go and ministering people, taking Alpha to people who have got absolutely nothing. It's like, I want to belong to a church like this. You know what I mean? <laughs> I, well, I suppose I do. But you know, you know, I mean, I really do, man. You know? Where have our feet taken us? Now, I don't know if you've, if you've checked this thing out. So Google has got this thing. You might not be happy to hear this, some of you. So Google has got this thing that it basically tracks you wherever you go. If you've got a phone and you're connected to Google. So you can go into Google, okay, and into the settings, and you can go like uh, travel history, whatever it is. And it basically tells you exactly every day. So when you're walking around with your cell phone or you get in your car and go somewhere, this big brother is tracking you, like all the time. You know how many people have been bust? No, I'm just going here or I'm just going there. And Google tells you something else. So you can go into your history and wherever you've gone with your phone, Google has tracked you. Even without you knowing it, maybe. Now I'm wondering, if we had to go into our Google Maps and check out, people are really changing their settings. No, they're not. If you, if you had, <laughs> I'm watching you. If you had to go into Google Maps now, and like, imagine if we could, like, from a faith perspective, type in, um, you know, uh, where my feet have taken me for God. I'm wondering what it would show. And like, I'm wondering like, if the only interaction we have is like, from, you know, out our beautiful sand road to your house, and then like next Sunday, back again, and then, what, what did your map look like? Now, I know that some of you do minister at work, and so it would show to your workplace. Uh, some of you do serve in, on boards and on charities for God, and maybe we'll show to that. It'll show people going to Leokop and back, to Clay Oven and back, to Dipsluit and back like we have this weekend. Because that is the church. Because we basically say, listen, you might have nailed Jesus' feet to the cross, but you cannot stop the church. Because we have picked up the baton. So can I maybe ask you, where, where, where have your feet taken you? Seriously. And if like 90% of the places that, that your feet have taken you to encounter Jesus is here, oh man, you're missing out. Before I get to my last point, I want to just say this quickly about the first two points about those two nails. Being a Christian can sometimes be incredibly frustrating, I've got to be honest with you. Because if, our, if, our, if our, where our feet have taken us is only home and church, 
You know, if this is the main place, ah, oh man, you're going to be incredibly, incredibly frustrated. Because if, you're, if your whole focus is around the church building and what happens here, you frust- I can tell you now you're frustrated. You have to be frustrated. You know, so, because um, you, you will, you'll find out that, that most of your life will be a going like, the church is not doing enough, man. Um, you know, the sermons are too long, the worship's too loud, the light's too dark. Oh, my kids, you know, the children's church wasn't really brilliant today. There's no one welcoming me at the door, and, it, 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 you know, Gary and Jackie let me down. Um, Pizile didn't, you know, the church staff. Your whole life will be consumed about what Grace Point is or isn't doing, or the people in it, or people in your home group that you're just frustrated with. But you see, when you get your hands dirty, and when your feet take you more than just to your house and back to this church again, when it takes you to the poor and into the prison, you begin to realize that church is more than just this on a Sunday or a Friday. It's so much more, trust me, it's so much more than any sermon that's ever preached or any worship song that's ever, it's so much more than that. Because I can tell you right now, I can, you can ask anyone, when you're sitting in the middle of Leoko prison and you see how a hardened criminal's life has changed when he stands up at a closing event and starts speaking about what Jesus has done for him and how he's recommitted his life to goodness, I can tell you now, whether we sang that song in English or Isizulu, whether we prayed in another language, whether we did, I can tell you now, it will be a complete non-event for you. I can tell you that now, whether the children's church is up to scratch or not, is not the point. When you are sitting in the middle of the poorest of the poor, and you're sitting with children who eat once a day, and you go and you take food, and you minister, and you become Jesus' hands, and you just hold a church that uh, hold a child that's probably never ever been held intimately before by a mother or a father. I can tell you now whether our children were entertained on a Sunday morning or not is not your number one priority, because it's bigger than that. But if your hands are clean and your feet have never taken you anywhere, no church will measure up to your standard, ever. And your faith will just become frustrating because you won't really see God really work and God really reach out. And I want to encourage you, go to places where Christ would want you to go. Do things in ministry and your life will be changed forever. I'm finishing with this final point and it's very brief. The third nail was used to to hammer the accusation and the charge of Jesus. He was ultimately charged with blasphemy, the king of the Jews. So Pilate went and had that nailed above Jesus. Here is the king of the Jews. This is the thing about Easter. Imagine for a moment if all of the things that we are charged with, in other words, the things that we had messed up on and the mistakes we had made, were hung up for the public to see. Imagine if, just like the charge against Christ, all the charges that should be leveled at us are put up for public display. You know, that's, that's quite a rough thing, man. If you had all your sins read out up on the, or put up on the screen here on a Sunday, it's like today we're dealing with Daniel's sin. Is the screen big enough? Uh, okay, we need to talk. Uh, uh, you know, and, and, and tomorrow it's someone else's. Imagine that, because that's really what happened with Christ. But you see what happened this day with this final nail. All our sin and all the accusations against us have been washed clean by the blood of Jesus. Any accusation, any charge brought against you was defeated on this day. Washed clean by his blood. Jesus said, your sin has been removed as far as the east is from the west. And really what he's asking us to do 
in terms of coming to this point of dying on the cross. He's asking you and I to live lives, not in shame or under the burden of guilt. Too many of us are living our lives with guilt and with shame and with things that we've done in the past. And it's, we might not be publicly on a piece of paper, have them nailed above us, but we live our lives caged, tied. The way we live our lives, we take it into our marriages, we take it into our families, we take it to our workplace. And, and Christ is saying, no more, it's finished. It's been cleaned, cleansed. You, your, those sins have been removed from you for once and for all. Don't live your life under the banner of shame or guilt. The whole point of Jesus' death, the whole point of being nailed to the cross, the whole point of having his blood shed for you and for me is for the forgiveness of our sins so that we do not need to live our life shackled to sin anymore. We've been set free. Now live like it. And one of the best witnesses we can ever have when we go and visit the, the sick or the poor, when we minister children, when we do all of these things, one of the best things ever is we go into this place and we say to people, man, I wish you could have what I have. Can I introduce you to Jesus Christ who's freed me from sin and shame? And we are called to proclaim Jesus as king, king of our lives. Know this today. Your sins are forgiven. Know this today. He came to remove any guilt that you may have for anything that may have happened or you have done in the past. Know this today that you no longer have to carry a banner of shame over your life for things that you've said or done because he has dealt with it once and for all. So, I'm going to close with a prayer. And I'm going to ask you, please, if you would like to start again, if you're serious about getting your hands dirty, if you're serious about, about moving for Christ and, and, and being the feet of Christ and the hands of Christ, if you've maybe got to a false sense of security or you are just idling along in neutral, and you want to recommit this Easter, your life to Christ, I'm going to ask you to, to, to pray a prayer with me. Or, 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 or maybe you're here today, and you are wanting to make a first-time commitment to Christ. I want to invite you today to pray this prayer with me. So I'm going to pray it. Uh, short bits at a time, then I'm going to ask you to please repeat that after me. I'm also going to ask you if it's possible to please do it aloud so that we can keep track of each other as we pray. So let's be still for a moment in the presence of God. Please repeat this prayer after me if you're wanting to cross the line of faith for the first time or if you want to recommit to your life. If you want to commit to using your hands and your feet to continue the work of Christ. Let's pray this prayer together. Please repeat after me. God, I recognize that I have not lived my life for you. I have been living for myself. Forgive me, I pray. I need you in my life. I want you in my life. I acknowledge the work of Jesus Christ on the cross. He gave his life for me. I long to receive forgiveness that you have made available for me. Come into my life now, Lord. Live in my heart as my King, my Lord, and my Savior. From this day forward, 
I will no longer be controlled by sin or the desire to please myself. But I will follow you all the days of my life. My days are in your hands. I ask this in Jesus' precious name. Amen.